Welcome to our SAS via transition topics office hours, there versus Sparks SQL usage, um, general use differences and using variables, then files, nesting notebooks, and comparing current data to brick SAS macros to specific PySpark SQL queries. So with that being said, I'm going to pass things over to Oren Prez now to give us more background about himself. Excellent. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, so I am one of the programmers on the team. I work with mainly SAS. I'm also working with getting it into data breaking again to Python. And you probably all see me help you with one help that figure or another. And yeah, that's me. I'm not going to share my screen. I see that we're seeing a lot of lag. So I'm not going to share my video, but I will share my screen. Let's get started. So today we are going to talk about an intro to SQL and to function. And the goals here are we're going to provide an introduction to Databricks SQL. We're going to discuss how to use variables in Databricks SQL queries. We're going to discuss how to use Spark SQL in, Spark SQL in Databricks. We're going to discuss importing and exporting Delta files. We're going to discuss how you can read new, new book, notebooks from other notebooks and how to create config files. And we're going to discuss the importance and how to create functions. So the reasons why you want to learn this is SQL is the first step to being able to build processes in Databricks. And we're talking about Delta because Delta is Databricks preferred way of storing data. And at some point what's gonna happen is when we're at that point, we're gonna to wanna to probably store data sets in Delta. That's how your stuff in the catalog is gonna be stored. And that might be how you wanna store stuff on your S3 workbenches. So understanding how to manipulate Delta is going to be very useful because that's how Databricks processes data better. And then the third thing, third one, you want to about the config files and functions, is that's going to allow for a significant reduction in code. And it's going to make it easier for you to convert your code from SAS to Databricks. Basically, the idea is if you have a config file that's where you have like 30 or 40 functions, you only need it to call it once. And if you have a function that can be reused, then theoretically you just use that function and you can use it instead of using Python code. And it makes things even easier when you create really good functions, really well-named functions. In theory, you can have somebody who doesn't know staff, doesn't know Python or doesn't know, or doesn't know R, they can run code in Python R just using your function if you do it well enough. So that's why we want to discuss all that stuff. So we discussed this before that Databricks notebooks, they support Python, R, Scala, and SQL. And in general, we've mainly been focusing on Python and SQL. And the Databricks catalog is designed to use SQL. So the database catalog, it's just like a database. It only is SQL stuff. And there are pros behind using the catalog and just not using notebooks. And the pro is that we're using SQL, it's easy to use, more users are familiar with it. And when you have data in a catalog, it's gonna run much faster. It's gonna be, it's just, it's just more efficient. That's why people usually store big data in databases. Problem gonna be that SQL itself is limited. You can use it for basic querying. You can use it to only manipulate something in the catalog. There's a limit to what you can do in SQL. And so that's what that's why we're gonna start talking about SQL. We're gonna start discussing that. But it's just something to keep in mind when you create things. Okay. So when you work in Databricks, you are supposed to create a, a specify a schema when you create something. If you don't, Databricks will save your data in the default schema. And if we go to the catalog and we go to default, you can see that there is this schema called default there. And you can see there's about 40 some tables here. And this is where tables go if you don't specify a schema. And the problem is you look at permission, you can see that there are a bunch of things that we can go down far enough. Right. 
perfect. You can see there's a lot of teams that have permissions to this. In theory, anyone can get here, which means that any data stored here isn't safe. Any data stored here can be deleted. And at some point, we're probably going to revoke permissions there that know me do stuff there. But that's where you, that's where data goes if you don't specify a schema in Databricks when you're using Databricks SQL. So let's just talk a bit about Databricks SQL right here. So when you go to up here in this corner, you can see that you have your choices of languages to use. This was running on a Python thing, so I wouldn't be able to connect to RSQL the only way to connect to SQL or Python or Markdown. But in theory, if you use Nordic one, you could use all of these. And when you use SQL, you're using Databricks SQL. And just think of a small thing, Markdown, that's for comments. So if you have a comment you want to write in, you can write in Markdown, you can make things bold. And it's a bit more useful than just doing comments because the whole thing is meant to be a comment. So it lets you add a few things to make things like nicer. Like if you want to make it all large, you want to make things in bold or something like that, you can use Markdown. Um, Python lets you mark program in Python, and any of these lets you mark program in any of those. SQL it lets you use Databricks SQL. And that's just an idea of you have your notebook that has a few any of these languages, and then you have each command can do its own language. So in theory, I can have Markdown, I can have Python, I can have SQL in a single notebook. It's just that if I make it a notebook and a Python thing, the notebook default will be Python. So anyway, this is just a, a, an idea of how you use SQL, Databricks SQL. And I'm not going to run this stuff now, but this would just run a, this is do a math problem. So this is just do two times one plus two or return six. And this right here would do a substring, for example, it would return the first five characters and we can need delta, possibly somewhere to fast. Here we have arrays. And this would this would take an array that has 10, 20, and 30, and it would return the third value because it's an array it starts at zero. So 10 would be zero, 20 is one, 30 is two, and it would return 30. And that's what that does. And then in also Daybreak SQL, you can do a map function, which is you set a, a number to a value. And this is helpful if you have like, I don't know, maybe you want to have, you're doing polling questions, you have one is yes, two is no. So you can just, you know, instead of having storing yes or storing no, you can do a map, and then you know one is yes, two is no. And it becomes very useful, like if you're doing stuff that has huge names, having numbers instead of the names just makes to make files smaller, it makes processing easier, and stuff like that. So you have that map. And then right here, we just have some stuff about this code, how you can actually query a table using Databricks SQL. And then finally, just basic things. You can get just information about yourself. You can write down, you would select the current user, and you can ask whether you're part of a group. And this comes in handy, I mean, not, not so much for yourself. Like, you'll know what groups you're in. You'll know who you are. But suppose you're running a notebook that's run by 10 people in your group. If you put down select current user, you know the last person who ran the, the, the notebook. And that means you'll know the last person who ran the notebook, you'll know who was the last person who created files and stuff like that. And that can come in handy because if a file doesn't get created, you run into an alter table issue. Well, at least you'll know who the last person was who ran this stuff and you'll know who to talk to. Okay. So the Databricks SQL also loads variables. The problem is it's not available in our environment yet. It will be when we upgrade to Databricks run some version 14.3 or higher. I believe we're at 12.2 at the moment. And at some time we're gonna update that, but I'm not sure when that is. And when that happens, you'll be able to use variables in Databricks SQL, and you can find some more information in the link provided. And basically, the way you create a variable is you just do a declare or replace variable statement. 
And here, for example, we have an integer. I'm sending the default value to 17 for my var. And here I'm doing the same thing. It's for a data set name, so it's for a string value. And I have it set to CDR info. In theory, the way it works is I can have these declare values at the start of my code. And then instead of you know, having to go through all my code and change things when things change, I could just change them here. So if I wanted to run a program monthly, instead of you know going through all my code and actually hard coding a month, I could just do it in when at the start of the statement or in an early command, just to call call the names and then in the code itself down below, just go to just call the variable. And I would only need to change things once, sort of like in stats with macro variables. And here we have a structure. So what this does is this creates a structure called address. And it has, if I already uh, call the name street, it would give me a value of Grimold place. If I do number, it would give me 12. And basically I can, I mean, let me basically just like connect a bunch of, it basically let me connect a bunch of things together. So instead of creating many different variables, I can just create them all in one structure and then just name them and then just like go to them based on what I want. Like if I wanted, if I wanted like a specific variable type, I could, a variable name, I could just put it in here, put in the value and I just need one thing instead of many things. And I am not running a, I'm not running anything, I'm not running a cluster on 12, on 14.3, but if I was, I could run something like this, and this would return 17 for my var, and we return 12 for the number because it is going to session, that's where all structures are stored, address, that is referring to my specific, that my specific structure, and then number, and that is the value here. So that would return 12. And yeah, do we have any questions? Not so far. Okay. So we talked a bit about Databricks SQL in and of itself when, and that Databricks SQL when you go to the SQL command. So it's important to understand that Databricks was built by the same people who designed Apache Spark. And Databricks SQL, it's largely, but not completely based on Spark SQL. And that's one reason why it makes sense to use PySpark or RSpark whenever possible. And another way we could use SQL is instead of using Databricks SQL, we can just use Spark SQL. They're going to work largely the same. The only thing is Databricks SQL is designed to be SQL specific, whereas Spark SQL is designed to work with Python. And the Difference is that when you run stuff in Spark SQL, you can run it alongside Python or R code. And so if I go here, you can see that I am running this in Python and this one right here would be running in SQL. And so the idea is that when I'm running the Spark SQL, I can run it in Python, which makes things easier, which is I can use that SQL while running Python code, which makes life a lot easier. But it doesn't, it requires me to use some uh, Python language. And in general, we recommend using Databricks SQL just to get used to the Databricks environment and when doing ad hoc queries. When you're doing uh, the processes, you're probably going to want to use Spark SQL. And so just to give a bit, basic idea how that works. So here I'm using Python, I'm creating a variable. I'm creating a variable DS name, its value is CDR info. And this would just would give me displayed account of what is in that public data, that CDR info thing. And you'll note I have to add this dot display to it. And that's because we're working in Python. Python wants an object. If you want to see what's in an object, it requires that dot display. So for Databricks SQL, if I have this command as a SQL command, I don't need that dot display. When I'm running stuff, in using Spark SQL itself, I do need that dot display. And so that's gonna be one of the challenges you're gonna face when you convert your code from Databricks SQL to Spark SQL. The SQL itself is gonna be the same, but you need to know about some of these things like the dot display, which 
it doesn't take so long to get used to it, but it can be confusing when you first start. And right here, this shows a select count from public data that yes name. This is actually calling the variable I named right here. So here I use Python to create a variable. Here I am calling it. And I need to use these two brackets to call it. And I put it in there and it will run nicely. And if I had to run that, that would work well. And the good thing about this is that I'm, this I'm, is... I'm sorry, I missed a... Do you mind if I ask a question or should... Um, can we please put the question in the chat? Sorry. And Yeah, sure. And we'll get at the end of the section. Thank you. So here we have... And then, so this is just how you would use a variable in a um, Spark SQL statement. And here we just have a Spark SQL query. And you can see we're name grabbing some variables here. We're doing a few special things to it. And we're adding stuff there and it would prevent, it would print out some information. And you can also use Databricks or SQL or Spark SQL to replicate existing test macros. They're used to move data from the test workspace to the CDR catalog or manipulate data on the CDR catalog. So remember the test workspace is the same as our S3 location where we store data. So when you write things to S3, you're writing things to the SAS workspace, and that is USM, UFM also. So when you send data via UFM, you're also connecting to that SAS workspace. And when SAS FIA goes away, that workspace will still exist because it is an S3. It's not really a SAS thing. It's more of an S3 thing. And SAS just knows to connect to there. So you can also use Databricks SQL to replicate some stuff that we use to move data from the workspaces to the CDR catalog or manipulate data on the CDR catalog. And one example, for example, is this here. This would create a table in, this is my thing, I call it Orange Let Me 2. Select from that table to Orange Let Me 1. This would create basically a, a clone of this table. And if I wanted to access it or see an account, I could run something like this. This gives me a display. I can drop stuff using this. One reason why we mainly built these still test macros help you connect to the CR catalog is largely because it would be difficult to connect to Databricks from SAS correctly. Now that we're all working in Databricks, it's less necessary. So you're not going to need the same macros we used in SAS, but you may want to use new ones to help make sure that you're querying the data properly. This may be that you're making sure that you're, you're then you may want to create something for a SQL statement to check to see whether all the variables in the block exist, or to check to make sure that all the tables from from the in the from statement exist, or maybe make sure that you're defining your relationship the way you think it is. So if you expect something to be a one to one relationship, make sure it's actually the case, or something like that. But you're not going to need to worry about the ones that we created before. You're probably going to want to create new ones to help make sure that your SQL stuff runs properly. And again, you can also use Spark SQL to determine information about the current user and display which groups they belong to. And again, you can use this at the beginning of a program to make sure the user belongs to the right group or also just to make sure that you know, you know who is running the code. So that way you can look through, you can see the last person you ran the stuff is, and then you know who's actually running the, 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 the programs. And this, for example, would be a SQL query that is used, I'm, I'm selecting the current user. That's how I get, that's how I get the, who the current user is. I'm naming it as current user name. Here, I'm collecting it. I'm printing it out right here. I'm, I'm grabbing the result right here, and then I am showing it. And you can see that for me, it's showing my group, and you can see I'm part of QDAS and admin. And maybe I want to store this in a list, so I just do something like this right here. And well, I have a list with all of my groups. Okay, and I see we have some questions in the chat. No, I was. Good morning. I had one. 
Oh, sorry, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, I no, was doing the same uh, one. Just letting Barry get a chance to, if he wants to ask his question, more than welcome to ask the question, but definitely put it in the chat too so that we can track it as well. But yeah, if you want to ask your question, Barry, more than welcome to ask it. We'll get into more detail. How that syntax reacts F a quote, some stuff, then a quote. What does it mean? Um, I, I, I'm sorry? So, in a, sorry. I, I know you asked me not to talk. I mean, just the F is for format. It's for example, a, it's a syntax. It's a syntax for Python. So when you're trying to do a string and you have like a variable within it that you want to call, you can either do it, lead it with an F, and then write the syntax and have the curly bracket with the variable name there, huh. okay. or you can do um, like a, a quote with just empty brackets and then a dot format and then list the variables afterwards. So this is just a, a more reader-friendly alternative for, for Pythonic expressions. Does, does that help, Barry? Does that make sense? The, yes, what, it what does. The Thank you very much. Yeah, yes, it's ba you. yeah, exactly as Dan said. It's a way to essentially pass variables, much like macro variables, right? Okay. Do we have any other questions or should I keep on going? I don't see any other questions at this point yet. Okay. Thanks so much. All right. So we've talked about data that's in the catalog. What about data that's not in the catalog? So instead, do you might run a proxy import to pull in data from Excel or CSV or JSON or what have you? And then once it's reported, you can. Uh, use ProxySQL to analyze that. In Databricks, you're going to need to pull in the data using Python or R. And you're not going to be able to use SQL because it's not going to be in the catalog yet. So it can't actually grab that data. So we discussed this during DataCamp. I'm not going to go into detail too much. But I've included a, a link to the notebook where we do discuss this and where Colton wrote a whole bunch of things. But just to show a few things, this shows you how to pull in data from the CDR into a PySpark data frame. And what we did here is we made a small little function that does it for you. And here it, it, bring, it requires a SQL query, a, a, technically a string value, which would be stored as the, the variable SQL. And basically what it's doing is it's reading in that SQL statement into this right here, and it reads it into a data frame, and then it returns the data frame. So here we are running the, our function. This is what I have for SQL, and it is storing it into that data frame. And here we are displaying it, and you can see that it worked. I have my stuff. It's Grabbing from, it's grabbing from public data that zip codes, and you can see it's printed out. Just to talk about Delta data a bit, and that's important. You're probably going to want to use that a lot. Here's how you can do that with Delta, and here what I'm doing is I'm putting my path as a string value. So I have all this stuff here that. I really don't want to write out every single time. So I'm just sending it as a variable. And then I'm going to add to it. I'm going to add my orange delete me 20 to it. And I'm running that. I'm loading. I'm going to read the format delta. I'm going to load it as a path into a data frame. And I'm going to split up data frame. And it shows up here. And what I could do very easily is create a function that Maybe it would require the root path, and maybe it would require the file name. But I could create a function like, I don't know, um, import delta to PySpark and have it do this for me and have it maybe even, if I had a root path, 
name variable, just put a brewcat variable in there. So I'd have this in there and then I have a file name to replace that. And I could make this into a function. And then I wouldn't need to memorize this, um, what if this, this command, I wouldn't have to remember exactly how to read it in as a delta. So just something to think about. And here, I think we've talked about this a bit, but here we are installing the PyRead stat package. You need to be careful about reading the packages you probably wanted at the beginning because it says here the Python interpreter will be restarted. We found that sometimes if we run this in the middle of programs, it might just erase functions that were defined earlier. So in general, make sure that you're installing stuff maybe when you need it and make sure it's at the beginning of stuff. And if you do have to do it in the middle of a program, maybe make sure that you recall any, any functions you had created. And here we just have a function. I have a function here. It basically uses pyread stat to read a stat 7 dat file into a data frame. And yeah, I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but basically the idea is I have that function. I put in the name of the location and the file, and it spits out data into a data frame and then spits out data into a metadata. So I'd be able to create a metadata to make sure that my data was stored properly in the, in the data frame. And then I could do stuff on the data frame itself. And here we have exporting Delta data best three from a Spark data frame. So this would actually write it. And here I have my, again, I have my location. And this would take that DF data frame, it would write it out. And if it is overwrite, so we'll, we'll over it regardless. And then this would check just to make sure I can write, read it in properly. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? No additional questions yet, Warren. Awesome. Okay. So in fact, you were able to use an include statement to run a different program inside the program you're running. And that probably came into a lot of use. If you, you could run your programs using the shell program. So maybe if you have a function, maybe had a workflow that consisted of 10 programs, instead of running all 10, you create a shell program that includes those programs in the shell program. And so you, you would basically have one program that might include program one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In that one set program, it would run all of them. It would run sequentially. So you don't need to worry about the you don't need to worry about maybe the program five run before program three. And that probably made things useful. And then you also had like auto accounts, right? And that was where you could store certain variable values, or you could store certain macros, and you could use them in programs. You just need to find them in one spot, and that would be that would be good. You could use them in everything that you were using. In Databricks, we can do something similar. We can run a notebook inside another notebook, and this allows us to basically create a config file, pretty much like an auto exec file that can be used to store functions that can be used in major programs without having to re recreate them every each time. So when you do this, you would do it by doing a percent run. And this run command, it has to be on the first line of a command. It has to be the only thing ran in that command. If I can't do like five of these in one command, I need to do them all differently. And I can't do anything before, I can't be anything after. So here we have this config and let's take a look at it. So here I am installing something called PyRedStat. I have that there. I have this right here. This gives me um, my username. It just gives me the cluster name that I'm working on. And this will actually print it out in the program that I'm running. And if I have this at the beginning, that's very helpful because I, again, that helps me know who the last person running stuff was. You know it was me. You know which cluster I was working on in case you maybe work on different clusters. And that way, if something goes wrong, you know who's the one who did it. And then here, this is just 
a basic function that basically does some logic. If it, says, it takes a number i and it says if i is greater than a thousand, that's not going to run. But otherwise, it it if you give it an input, it will spit out an output. And here we have this return a, a character value. And this is going to return carvar, which just says this return a character value in the literature like that. And here's another function that will return two values, variables. And one is a character, one is an integer. And this just sets that this says it just re returned a char value. This just says five. Not particularly useful like this, but does show how you could create a function. And then here we have our convert test and b that's a data frame, which we talked about. And then we have these two, and these two are a bit more useful. This one is, this one gives me the QDAS workbench, provided I provide my test workbench, provided I provide my final name. And basically what this does is it looks at my cluster. It basically says, if I have a cluster, then it'll look at the workbenches I could have, and it's going to spit out the root path. And that will look at the root path. It will also look at the file name provided here, and then it'll return a path. And now this is useful because now all I need to know is which workbench I was work the file is on, the path to the file, and now I don't even need to remember all this stuff. I just use that QDS workbench because it's here, and yeah, I'm sure no one wants to remember all this stuff. So this would just get rid of the need for it and probably make our life a lot easier. And then the more thing for my QDS database, here I just, I'm calling in a database, I'm calling in a file name, I'm making sure you're part of the right cluster, and then this would also return the root path in the file, and this would return the location, and it returns that, I have it returned that path, path is going to be just, this is gonna be a variable, so it return this variable there. And then here, for example, this runs a display directory. And this is just going to show everything that's in the task workbench in the appropriate path where you look at. And this will just show stuff. So any files you have. And we're going to type out that pretty soon. So here we discussed a config. So in fact, we created macros when we wanted to create code snippets that we could use run over and over. Here, we're creating functions. And this function, you can see I had an input of 10, it output 23. And this value, this is something that was used to print out a value, but I can use it to set up a variable or to set up a data frame like we're going to discuss in the next one. And here, this does return char var output equals return char var. So if we go here, let's go back up. And you see how this says return char far? This means that this definition is going to return whatever value is in char far. So this returned a character value. When I set the when I set a variable equal to the function, it's going to take the value of what was returned in the function. So as a result, when I do the print. This is going to say, this is the result of the first function, and this returned a character value. So return char far output, this stores the value of what was output in the return char far function. And likewise, I can have a function create multiple variables. So here we're using that return too far, too far. And if we go to the function, you see how it's returning two things. So I'm sending two variables equal to this function. And it is going to return both of them. So you can see that it returns CV, it returns the char far value, and this returns five. And so I have to simply keep in mind that a function can create multiple variables if you need to. And then here, this is creating two data frames. And the first one, that DF one, that is a PySpark data frame. This one is just one that stores metadata information. And this would show you information about the file by looking at the link. Yeah, if you were to run this, then it would show you that, or it would print out information that way. And it would do things like that. Here, what we have is an example of the QDAS workbench macro. We just talked above. Here, I'm grabbing something from Daymod in staff. That is my team's workbench. 
and I'm grabbing stuff from this file, and this puts it all together into one thing. It puts out the root, and it returns that. And in theory, I could use something like path equals QDS workbench. Daymod. I'm just going to copy the rest of it because we need to. And now path would have the value. And here we have some stuff that lets you build functions that replicate DB build functions. And this is another one that we have. And this would let you display the directory. And here you can see we are looking at Dassy Simplicity. I'm grabbing stuff from that workbench. And I'm grabbing stuff from this folder. And you can see I am printing out path information. And yeah, one of the challenges we're going we're gonna to face when moving from Python versus staff is that Python programmers, they typically create more smaller functions and they may want to reuse them. It's much more building a code base and reusing those functions rather than just writing everything from scratch. In staff, it's more programs are a lot more independent. In Python, they're not supposed to be. You're supposed to like create a function and you're supposed to build on it. And yeah, storing functions and using the build things are going to become much more important as you be transitioned from Python to staff. So you should have learned the following from this discussion. You should have learned more about how to use Databricks SQL and Spark SQL and when to do so. You should learn more about how to use variables in Databricks SQL and Spark SQL. You should have a bit better of understanding about how to import and export data from S3 to data frames or the catalog. And you should have a better idea about how you can use functions going forward and just a basic understanding of how functions work. Okay, are there any questions? There's no other questions in the chat, but I feel like this would be a really good time if verbally anyone had questions and wanted to just go ahead and talk through them, that would be fine. Or, and it's really whatever you prefer at this point. Um, verbal is fine as long as we think we can, it, one of the reasons why we want questions in the chat is just so it makes it easier for us to keep a record of what was asked so we can add the confluent. So whatever you guys want, if you, I'm happy to have verbal stuff if you, if you think that we can, that can work. Courtney just asked if they can receive the link to the notebook. Yes, um, the note, the links will be provided. It's gonna be that sense transition page. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but. I'm I can, can get it for you, Orin, and copy it and paste it in. Well, thank you. And then Barry, I saw that you asked about the recording. The recording is also going to be made available there as well. Miriam just shared the events site and that's where everything is going to be housed. Any other questions so far? Okay, here's another one. If I use Databricks SQL to create a temporary view, would I need to drop the temporary view after use? No, you wouldn't. The temporary view will go away. I think it's going to be when you get removed from the cluster. And yeah, you create a temporary one, it is fine. Okay. Um, are there any, um, are there plans to put together functions as part of an auto exact similar to the global SAS macros available in VIA? That's an interesting question. Um, we've talked some about creating a possible GitHub repo that potentially users could contribute to or potentially our help desk could do. And I don't know if it's going to be necessarily like an auto accept, but I think we are going to provide GitHub stuff that in theory you guys could call. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I can speak a little bit more to this. So definitely it's in the works. Um, we're, we're right in the middle of setting up what we're going to kind of refer to as like the CCSQ 
uh, community code repository, and it's going to have a lot of different functions and use cases and code snippets of a lot of what we've covered here, as well as in data camp that will be, you know, um, all within a, like a single file or within a single notebook. So if, 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 if you're wanting to know, you know, how do you, how do you, ex how do you write out a spark data frame to Excel or, you know, how do you run a frequency distribution and stuff like that? Like we'll have specific code within that repository that'll be available out onto the workspace. And eventually that's going to migrate into something very kind of similar to like the global SAS macros, where we will have a user defined functions that would be basically creating modules that are loaded out onto everyone's compute clusters to be able to use, right? So uh, an example of one could be, um, you know, uh, some kind of a function that you provides a few parameters and it reads in a SAS data set into a Spark data frame from your S3 workbench. Or maybe it will replicate the output of a frequency procedure in SAS, right? Having distributions of frequencies, percent, cumulative frequency, cumulative percentages. That will eventually become something that like can morph into like a community repo where other users if they are developing functions, like you can, you can contribute and go through some review processes and stuff. And then like that gets added into the repository that other people can utilize. And um, we're still working on what it's going to look like. We're in the very beginning stages of creating that repo and, and, and how it's going to be deployed automatically. But that is something that we are working on and, and will be coming in the future. But some, some of, Again, some of the like the macros that are very heavily utilized to hit like the database tables and stuff, those aren't going to be required within the Databricks notebooks because you don't need those external connections and pass throughs and and things of that nature that that you're utilizing those types of macros for, if that makes sense. Okay, we had another question. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> um, are Spark data frames temporary or should we delete them? If they are temp, is it a good practice to delete as code executes and they are no longer needed? Um, if they are temporary, it, it does make sense to delete them if they're not needed. It probably isn't a big deal unless they're huge. Like, at some point, they might be a problem, problem, but as long as they're not huge, it's probably not a big deal. Yeah, and, and this, actually, Dan did a, he covered this um, on our office hours topic three. Wait, is this three or four? Goodness me. <laughs> this um, is four. This four. four. Okay, yeah, topic three that is going to be out there for people to you to, to, to look at, um, as well as we're going to redo it as well. But he talks about how the data frames are stored in memory. And yes, if it's a, like, like Oren said, if it's a really large data frame, like, you know, many gigs of, of data, of data that you're storing in a data frame and you've got lots of data frames that you're creating off of, off of it, that's going to take up the available memory or RAM that you have across your compute cluster, right? Especially if other people are using it in your organization that adds up and so it, it is kind of a best practice as you're moving forward to either just kind of keep the same data frame that you're creating modifications to or cleaning up data frames that you no longer need um in your process as you're moving forward with whatever it is you're doing to the data as you're working with it but like Oren said if it is small it's i mean you've got 32 gigs on the driver. And if you're using Spark, that's going to distribute across up to 30 worker nodes where you're going to have, I mean, almost half a terabyte worth of, of data avail of memory available to you. So a lot of memory available, but understanding some of the data we work with is really large. So best practices definitely clean it up. And then there is code that does clean it up and, and, and does kind of garbage collect. Um, as well as 
Databricks has its own thing that kind of garbage collects and cache files and things like that. Um, yeah, I don't. Dan, did, was there anything else you wanted to talk about that? No, it's a it's a really interesting uh, thing to get into, but unless you're really working with like heavy amounts of data, um, there's not you know there's no reason to to go down that that uh, rabbit hole. Um, I, best practice, and as we discussed last week, was to keep the minimal number of data frames that you need, um, and then even like actual deletion, like you can delete a data frame, but the cached memory is still there until garbage collection comes along. Um, and so it's really just, yeah, it, just keep as few data frames as you actually need. Yeah, but, and, and, and again, you know, because these are temporary clusters and after 60 minutes of inactivity, they auto terminate, so, obviously all that stuff is in memory it's it's gone so if there's something you need to keep you have to you need to write it to a database table um or export that data frame out as delta or parquet of or you know of some kind to your s3 workbench and your entire organization is using the same compute cluster so just because you're not doing a lot of heavy data work Somebody else may be, and they may end up, their work may then cause your cache to have to be cleared out. But that's why it's just best practice to, to just try to not have, you know, 30 million data frames sitting around. And if you want to export 30 million intermediate data sets as Parquet files, then, then go for it. But yeah. Yeah, so basically just to sum up, you don't need to, but you have large data frames and you're working on, and you or someone on your team is working on highly data intensive processes, then it, yeah, it would make sense to get rid of like huge ones. Did we answer the temporary view question? Yeah, yeah. Oren answered it. Okay, sorry. I, I was totally paying attention, I promise. I just don't remember. <laughs> I just got another one. It was just a direct message. What is the difference between Parquet and Delta tables? Um, there's just two different ways of storing data. So Parquet is one way of storing data, and Delta is another way of storing data. And it's sort of just like how CSV and CSV are ways of storing data or how JSON is a way of storing data. Parquet is used a bit more universally, I feel like. Parquet has been around longer. And, but the thing is that for Databricks, they're designed to use Delta. And so, so it's just a way of storing data and it's just a way of storing data that works well with Databricks. Yeah. And, and again, um, topic three of office hours that will be available within the, the recording and, 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 and all of that stuff that Dan presented will be available in the portal as well as we will have uh, re-presenting uh, sessions, I guess I'm going to call it that, on it. So you will be able to learn more about it. But yeah, Dan talks a lot about Delta versus Parquet and, and why those are the two preferred and Delta is a little bit more efficient within Databricks itself. I'll just add that all the all the notebooks are available, even if like the recordings aren't. So like the topic three notebook is available for you to view, and most of the content was all within that presentation, or that presentation's content content was mostly all just markdown cells within that notebook. Okay, another question: Do we have an easy way to interact with the project workbench within Databricks yet for viewing data set names, et cetera, like in SAS Bio? That's something we're working on. It's not going to come until we have Unity Catalog. So easy, not so much. There are ways to do it. You can use the DBU tells, like Dan talked about in session two. 
and you could, in theory, use that function I used to show the files in a, in a directory that I created for this one. You can also use UFM. By the time testify is decommissioned, there should be an easier way to do it. It should be much easier. So until that happens, it may be easier to look at data using Sapphire or to use look at data via UFM. And we know about this is yet easier, and it's definitely something we're working on, definitely on our list.